Hey Church family, it's Pastor Riley here, and I just want to welcome you to our online gathering. Whether you're watching at home, maybe on your phone, wherever you're at, I just want you to know that you have a place here at Calvary Monterey. We're thinking about you and praying for you. One of the prayers that I'm praying for you is that you have a relationship with God that's much like King Asa had with God back in the book of 2 Chronicles. It says that King Asa drew near to God and God drew near to him. And that's my hope for you right now, that as you spend some time committing yourself to God through singing, through getting into his word, that God would speak to you in such a powerful way, that your life be transformed, and that your home, workplace, family would never be the same because of what God's doing inside your heart right now. So we wanna see God glorified through this online service. So I wanna pray real quick and commit this time to him. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Thank you, Father, that no matter where we're at, that you are close. And just like King Asa experienced, we wanna draw near to you and see you draw near to us. We wanna see you and your name be lifted up in a big way in our homes and in our lives. And we pray that through this time of singing and getting into your word, through prayer and giving, through all of this, that you be so blessed through our lives. That you help us to reorient and realign our values towards your son, King Jesus. So we give you this time and we thank you for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, hey, good morning, church. Let's take a minute and sing to our God. Our God is holy. There is no one like him. He is far above us, and we have the chance to, to praise Him and worship Him today. So let's sing together. Sing, you speak. You speak and waters crash upon the sand. push and pull at your command you hold the moon and stars within your hands and all with just a breath the world began and we sing God there's nobody like you God there's nobody like you, God, and there will never be. When nothing, when nothing we could do would be highest place you reached for us my sin is shame forever overcome grave was overwhelmed by perfect love yet we sing God there's nobody like you God there's nobody like you God, and there will never be. Man, let's sing it again. Oh God, there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. And there will never be. Your name is greater than any name I know. Your throne is higher than any other throne. You are the author, the creator of it all. You stand alone. You stand alone. Oh, God, there's nobody like you. 
There's nobody like you, God. And there will never be. One more time. Sing it out, God. Oh, God. There's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. And there will never be. the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more now let's see it again praise the lord praise the lord His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Pour out 
mark your power in love as we sing holy 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 yes you are high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out your power in love as we sing holy set apart there is nobody like you and there will never be you are the merciful God the gracious God we love and adore you today we bless your name amen well hey church family right now we're going to take a minute and I'm going to lead us in praying over the the gifts the tithes the offerings that you have given this week thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, Throughout scripture, God invites us to to give to his kingdom work. This is a way that that we can express our love and devotion to him. And our church has has been able to do so many really wonderful things in this season with the gifts that you have given. Uh, So again, thank you. If you. If you'd like to give, there are a couple different ways to do that. You can Send a gift into the church by mail. Visit the website and give there or even text an amount to the number on your screen. But however you choose to give, we we thank you for that. And now we want to commit these gifts to the Lord. So would you pray with me? Lord God, we pray that, that you would just bring your blessing and favor on all those who have sacrificially given in a financial way this week. We know that you see them and are blessed and honored by them. Lord, would you use these gifts for your kingdom and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey church, great to be with you on yet another Lord's Day as we seek to honor him during this wild and unprecedented time. If you have your Bible with you, would you Open it to or turn it on to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, as we continue our study in uh, Mark's Gospel. And as you're turning there, just a couple of announcements that I wanted to give to you. First of all, uh, this Tuesday night at Tuesday Night Church, Pastor Jeff is actually going to be sharing in the Word this week. So I can't wait to hear the Word that the Lord places upon his heart for you, for us as a congregation. And of course, you can get that. Uh, streamed on Tuesday, but also archived everywhere that Calvary Monterey puts their teaching. So our podcast, YouTube, calvary.com, you can grab that teaching in those places. I also wanted to mention, though, that this coming Thursday, I'm going to release a special teaching to the church on all of those channels, plus nateholdridge.com, called Some Presidential Election Uh, thoughts or encouragements for our congregation. I just feel uh, compelled to encourage you during this season to try to speak some biblical truth and pillars into your heart and into your mind uh, during what is obviously a tumultuous uh, presidential election season and campaign. And so I hope to, of course, remind you of the gospel and uh, refresh you in the word of God and uh, uplift you during this time that can be uh, difficult to navigate as a believer who is also a citizen of this great nation. So please tune in to that on Thursday. I'll remind you of it next week as well. 
so that you can grab a hold of that and you can either read it at nateholdridge.com or listen to it there uh, as well as along with all of our other channels uh, that we have as a church. Uh, but with all of that said, <clears throat> I want to now turn to Mark's gospel, Mark uh, chapter 10. Uh, and, and before we do, I just want to pray a prayer, asking God to bless our time in the word. And specifically, it's on my heart today to be praying for you and everything that you're endure, enduring uh, as a result of this virus and the upheaval that's connected to it. So God, I do pray for your people that are tuning in today and ask, Lord, and pray that you would be with us as a church family. We pray for every person that's in this church that you would provide for their every need. We pray that you'd keep us healthy, Lord, and strong. We pray that you get us through this chaos and tumult. And Lord, we pray for grace to navigate these times uh, with grace. And Lord, now we thank you for your word and we ask that you'd speak to us from it. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Okay, Luke, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, also wrote the book of Acts. So he wrote Luke and he wrote Acts. And the first verse of the book of Acts, his second book, starts like this. In the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, Jesus started his ministry in the record there in the book of Luke, but his ministry continued in the days of Acts. Luke knew that Jesus's mission had begun with his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, but that Jesus is still on his mission. That's why he said all that Jesus began to do and to teach, because Jesus is still doing and still teaching today. His cross saves and now Jesus urges his church on by his spirit that we might also engage in his mission with him. Now our passage today is going to portray Jesus in a very direct sense on that mission. The whole passage is going to start with Jesus on the road to Jerusalem where the powers of darkness are going to converge to crucify him. Uh, two of his disciples are going to make a special request of him, but it's a request that is in error. And the other disciples are going to be angry because of this request, and Jesus will have to teach all of his disciples uh, in response. And then Jesus will continue on his journey. And as he continues, he's going to pick up a new disciple named Barnabas, and they will together continue on the road that Jesus is taking to Jerusalem. So it starts on a road. There's a conversation with his disciples. He teaches his disciples about service. Then he gets a new disciple, and the passage ends on a road. It's a beautiful passage because it shows us that Jesus uh, it was determined to go to the cross. Death loomed and Jesus rushed towards Jerusalem. His time had come. He had to engage his mission. That's why he had come, to, to die. Now in studying this section, we should long to be part of Christ's ongoing mission, as I already said. As we follow him through this text, I hope that we will become more strongly persuaded to follow him in our everyday lives. So let's start off reading the first movement of our passage together in verse 32 to 34. It says, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Okay, in these three short verses, uh, again, Mark portrays Jesus on uh, his journey. He's going to Jerusalem. Now, from the valley below, 
Uh, Jesus and his disciples had to climb 3,500 feet to get up to Jerusalem. That's why it says they were going up to Jerusalem. And Mark portrays it as a solitary journey for Jesus. It says in verse 32 that he walked ahead of his disciples. He was alone in front of his men. Now, speaking of the disciples, Mark tells us that they were amazed and afraid while on this journey with Jesus. You know, Isaiah tells us prophetically that when the Lord would head to Jerusalem, he would set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. And Jesus' determination and focus was now obvious to his disciples, and it intimidated them. It was an ominous moment. Intuition told them that this trip to Jerusalem would be unlike any other trip they'd ever taken with Jesus to Jerusalem. Now Mark tells us that Jesus prepared his disciples for what was going to happen once they got to the holy city. He had told them of his death twice before in Mark's gospel, but this time he gave them even more details. In verse 33, he told them that the, relig the religious leaders would condemn him to death. In verse 33, he told them that those religious leaders would also hand him over to the Gentiles, something that they had to do because they could not legally execute uh, anyone. That was Rome's uh, purview. And he told them that they would mock him and spit on him and flog him. And then he would rise from the, de the dead. That, that was a detail he'd already given to them. But these other details were new in the account, very specific. This shows us the dedication of Jesus. He knew the precise details of what he was about to endure. The Son of God, God the Son, knew exactly what was coming, what was waiting for him there in, in Jerusalem. And still, Jesus determined to go. He set his face toward the cross. But not only does this show us the dedication of Jesus, it shows us the courage of Jesus as well. You know, there's a type of courage that responds to an emergency. You know, the building begins to burn and someone runs in. They're responding to the emergency. There's a, not a lot of premeditation in certain types of courage. But then there's a type of courage that sees the pain and the heartache and the cost a long way off, but still chooses to head towards it, to go right into it. And Jesus, of course, from eternity past, knew that even the act of creation would cost him, ultimately, his life in order to save us. The son, from far off, in a premeditated way, was courageous, willing to suffer and die. But this detail that Jesus gives about the coming cross in Jerusalem also showed the disciples and shows us today the sovereignty of God. You know, God was in control in that moment. I don't know if you've ever read Psalm 22, but the details inside of it are astounding. It was written many years before crucifixion was even invented, even invented and of course many years before the time of Christ himself. But in that psalm, the psalmist laid out in detail how the Messiah would die once he came. It helps us understand that God was in control of all the events that unfolded in Jerusalem when Jesus was betrayed, arrested, beaten, and crucified, and buried. God was in control. God had planned these events. God was in control then, just as he's in control now, by the way. You know, without these details, the disciples might have become convinced in Jerusalem that God's plans had been disrupted. There's Jesus. He's dying. God's plans have been overturned. But with these details, they could understand that God was in control. And Jesus wanted his disciples to know of God's sovereignty before the chaos rained down upon him. And he wants us to know that he's in control in times of chaos as well. And for this, we must be a thankful people. You know, first we have to be thankful in reading this passage for a God who is in 
control. Even in times of chaos, he reigns supreme and is unfolding his kingdom and his plan. I know the world seems chaotic and disrupted during this season, but I can also report to you that as much as the powers of darkness have their track, God has his track as well. He is doing things that are beautiful and wonderful in times of upheaval. Just as there was a great Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s during the countercultural revolution uh, that occurred in the West during that time, God was moving during that season, during times of great upheaval. And I believe in this season of upheaval that we're in, in our modern time, God has a parallel track where he is working, seeking, and saving those who are lost. But another thing we should be thankful for in this passage that we've already read today is that we have a God who knowingly rushed to the cross for us. Jesus knew exactly what it would cost, yet he still went to the cross. This is the love of God, that we can be refreshed, that we are a loved people when we look at Jesus's behavior and going to the cross. Now in the midst of that, Jesus's disciples approached him. So let's read this next movement in verse 35. It says, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Okay, so here we find two of Jesus' disciples respond to Jesus' announcement about his death. It's an ominous moment. It's a dark kind of season. And their response just comes across as dense and totally out of touch. They say to Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. You know, we know you're about to die in Jerusalem, but we have something that you, we want you to do for us, you know, in response. Just a little request. We want to sit at the positions of highest honor, your right and left hand, when you come into glory. We're not even going to tell you, Lord, who gets to sit on the right and who gets to sit on the left, just as long as it's the two of us. You know, they wanted the highest positions. Now, maybe they thought they had a chance. I mean, James and John were often part of Jesus' inter inner circle with Peter. And maybe Peter had said enough awkward things that in their minds they thought he had been bumped from the top two. Maybe they could get those positions of honor. Now, as much as this was a dense request, I'm not prepared to berate these guys too harshly. I mean, after all, they did still believe in Jesus' glory. He just told them that he's going to die and rise from the dead, and they tell him that they want to sit at his right and left hand when he comes into his glory. This is their way, I think, of saying we believe in the ultimate outcome. You are going to sit upon the throne. Whatever's going to happen there in Jerusalem, you are going to conquer. But of course, the timing and the content of this request is terrible. I think they knew that it was terrible. Uh, part of the reason I think they knew it was terrible is because Matthew tells us that it wasn't just them that asked, but they actually employed their mother to ask on their behalf a messenger, a go-between between, between Jesus and themselves. I mean, that's a bad prayer when your mom has to ask for you. Now, looking back, James and John would agree with us that their request was woefully out of touch. You know, we might castigate them for making a request like this, but here's a question. Aren't our prayers often out of touch with Jesus's mission as well? I mean, he's already died and risen, but now he is working to seek and save that which is lost. He is working to make disciples of all nations. And yes, we are to cast all of our anxieties upon him, but we have to guard against asking amiss for our own pleasures, our own desires. Instead, we need to consider the mission that Jesus is on and pray accordingly. But Jesus, 
he also would not ridicule these men for their requests. Instead, he interviewed them. So let's see what he said. Verse 38, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the, with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So Jesus here told them that they didn't know what they were asking. And then he asks them, can you drink my cup and can you partake of my baptism? Now, both those terms, the cup and baptism, they speak of times of difficulty. In the Old Testament, the cup was often an emblem of God's wrath. And the baptism that Jesus spoke of here wasn't the baptism that he received in the Jordan River from his cousin, John the Baptist. No, it's the deluge of pain the flood of tragedy that Jesus would endure on the cross. Now, they didn't know that he meant that, the wrath and the pain of the cross. So they said, yes, we are able. And they were right. Jesus said they would partake of his cup and his baptism. And when you follow out the lives of these two men, you discover that both of them would suffer for Christ. James was the first apostle to die. He was martyred by King Herod in Acts chapter 12. John was the last apostle to die, but he suffered a lot through the duration of his life and his final days were spent on the Isle of Patmos as a prisoner persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Still, the positions of honor, Jesus said, were not his to grant. He'd have to defer to his father for that decision. Now, before we move on, the, on in the text, I should say that many have wondered if James and John thought back to the events of the cross with their immature request echoing in their minds. Some wonder if when they looked back on the cross and saw the two criminals being crucified with Jesus on their crosses, on his right hand and on his left hand, if they realized then the folly of their request? It's a good question. Now, verse 41, it says, And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are rulers are, are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right, so here we see that after they made their special request, James and John, the 10 were angry at those two. Now, they weren't angry at James and John's insensitivity towards Jesus in asking him a question during a moment like this as he's on his way to the cross. But this wasn't their uh, misplaced desire to honor Jesus. They were angry to have been undercut for the positions they also craved. So Jesus responded by giving them yet another lesson on servanthood. It was one of his constant messages to his disciples. He didn't mind their desire to be great. He didn't mind their desire to be first. He was happy that they wanted to excel, but they hadn't the first clue on how to excel in Jesus's kingdom. They needed according to Jesus, to become servants and slaves of all. Now, he'd taught them about servanthood before, and he would teach them about servanthood again. In fact, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, when they had the Last Supper together, he took the garments of a household servant and a bowl of water, and he began to wash the feet of all of the disciples. It was the job of that 
lowest servant in a household. And as he did this to his disciples, Jesus said, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. This was not Jesus' way of literally telling us that we should have foot washing ceremonies. He's saying what must be done to minister to others uh, especially in the body of Christ, you should take that position of servanthood and serve one another. Then Jesus said in verse 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, the big example of service that they needed was right there in front of them. They should not look to the way of the world and its exercise of power, Jesus said. But he said, look at me, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, in other words, God the Son, the Son of God, the Son of Man, identifying with man, becoming a man for us, He came, Jesus said. That means he stepped out of eternity, the glory of heaven, and did not expect to be served when he came. He came to serve. And his service was to give his life. He knew that his death was what we needed so that we could live. So he served humanity by giving his life, he said, as a ransom for many. Now, we usually use the word ransom to describe the paying off of a kidnapper or a terrorist or someone like that. But it means to pay the price. Jesus' life was the price to purchase us out of our slavery to sin. His death set us free from our death. His life is our life. Now with all this in mind, we have to assume then that in the mind of Jesus, a hallmark of Christ followers today is service. You know, Jesus served by laying down his life. He told his disciples to be great by serving. So it's a mark of true Christianity when we serve today. And in a sense, you could say it like this, we need to serve. You know, why do we need to serve? Well, we need to serve because it gets our eyes off of ourselves. You know, all too often we read books and collect podcasts and even listen to preachers who tell us that it's all about us. And their messages are designed to empower us. But all this comes from a culture that is drunk on power, always trying to get more power. But is that what Jesus came to teach? No, instead, he promotes a power from above that embraces weakness and manifests itself in love. But how are we to serve? You know, if we need to serve, if we should serve, how are we to serve? How are we to reject the patterns of power that are often found in the world? How do we do it? Well, first, we should consider Jesus. You know, he came as the slave and servant of all, but he did not attempt to do everything there was to be done. That was not his view of service. He left the earth with people unhealed and nations unreached. He had his role to play, and of course, it was the most significant role. He had to go and die on the cross, and he would not be distracted from that mission. Now, the disciples, they followed a similar method once they began serving the Lord. You know, they refused to involve themselves in tasks in the early church that took them away from their primary purpose of prayer and teaching. In other words, they knew who they were and what it meant for them to serve the body. Like Jesus and these disciples, we must know who we are and what we're meant for on the earth. 
then we have to serve humanity by doing those things. But another way that we can serve or, or a- answer the question, how can we serve, is to have a broad vision for the word service. I think too often we read about service passages like these and we assume that we should sign up to helping Calvary kids as a response. But we would be mistaken if we can find Jesus' commission to a life of service to only Sunday mornings or our church life. Instead, we should see everything that we do as an act of service to others. So if you're a golf professional, then serve your community, the people around you. If you're in finance, serve. If you're in education, serve. If you're in the military, serve. By all means, in every relationship, take a posture of service. Third, we can also serve by serving in Calvary Kids or other church-related ministries. You know, leading a life group or serving the next generation or helping the congregation, congregate, hosting the congregation through ushering and greeting and all of that, it's a joy. So it might not be your only ministry or the main thing you're called to, but serve. All right, let's conclude by looking at our last little movement in the story. It says, and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. All right, in this final story, They pass through Jericho on this journey. And on their way out of town, a crowd gathers around them. You have to remember, it was almost time for the Passover. That's why Jesus was going to Jerusalem at that time. And many priests lived in the city of Jericho, about 15 miles away from Jerusalem. So the road that they were traveling on would have been packed with travelers and well-wishers greeting and saying goodbye to the people that were heading into town. And there was a buzz already surrounding this Galilean rabbi named Jesus. Now a blind beggar named Bartimaeus sat on the roadside, collecting anything that he could from travelers. And when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, he called out to Jesus. Now the title that Bartimaeus gave to Jesus is central to the story to the story. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He believed that Jesus was the son of David. It's the only time in Mark's gospel that someone gives Jesus that title. It's a messianic title. It indicates that Jesus is the king that they all waited for, the one who descended from David. And it's a remarkable confession. Mark does little things in the story to help us know that it's remarkable. Uh, This is the last recorded miracle, uh, or healing miracle that Jesus performed uh, for one. It's the only time that a person's name is recorded when Jesus heals them. And it's the last event before the Passion Week. Mark knew that this was an important healing, an important moment. And through Mark, Jesus silenced people. All through the book of Mark, Jesus silenced people. He told them not to tell anybody what they what he'd done for them or what they'd seen. And why did he do that? Well, he did that because they hadn't really understood who he was. Religious leaders, the crowds, and even his own disciples didn't get it. But Bartimaeus 
this blind beggar on the side of the road, he gets it. He knows Jesus is the son of David. In other words, the blind man saw. He understood. Well, the sighted were actually blind. They could not see. So Jesus calls the man over and asks him the same question he'd asked James and John earlier on the same road. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Remember, he'd asked that of James and John when they approached him. Now he asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And I love that Bartimaeus did not hesitate. He knew what he wanted from the Lord. Immediately, he asked for his sight. He didn't want wealth. He didn't want power. He just wanted to be able to see again. Now, some of you might wonder what the difference is between his request and the request of James and John. Jesus asked both of them, what do you want me to do for you? One difference between them is found in Bartimaeus's response. You know, he already, when Jesus called him to come to him, still blind, cast aside his garment. That was his beggar's garment that he would lay out in the road for people to give him alms. It was his way of saying, I don't need this anymore. I know what's going to happen to me. And Jesus said that Bartimaeus had faith, that his faith had made him well. But then after he received his sight, Notice what happens in verse 52. He followed Jesus on the way. You see, our passage today began with Jesus on his road to the cross. And now our passage today ends with Jesus on the road to the cross, but with Bartimaeus in tow. This guy, in other words, was a new follower of Christ. He would follow the servant Savior. He would join Jesus on his ominous trek to Mount Calvary. Now the others might have been afraid and amazed, but Bartimaeus was ready for the ride. So his request was not a request meant for personal glory, but for personal discipleship. He wanted to see so that he could follow Jesus. He wanted to better devote himself to the son of David, and join his team. What about you? What requests do you have for Jesus? Are they veiling desires for personal prestige and power? Or are they meant with the hope that you'll be able to follow Jesus better? Let's get on that road with Jesus. God bless you, church. I pray you have an amazing week. May God bless you richly. Hey church, another great word from Pastor Nate. I hope you're feeling filled up with God's word today. Before you go, I just have a couple things I want to share with you about what's going on at Calvary and how you can stay connected this week. As you might know, our life groups are in full swing right now. These are our small groups that gather throughout the week to be able to talk about God's word together, pray, share meals. It's the way we really do life and follow Jesus together. If you're maybe hearing about this for the first time and haven't joined a life group, we wanna really help you get plugged into community this quarter. So go to the link down here on the screen, contact somebody on our life group team and they will be sure to get you into a group that fits with your schedule and stage of life. We wanna make sure that you are having Christian community through the end of the year. Hey, on October 31st, we're having a fall fun gathering here at the church on the lawn. We're having a movie. We're having games. We're having more candy than you can handle. And so we wanna encourage you to come out here for this really great night. We're having two separate times where you can come out just so we can make sure we you know, properly distance and keep our face coverings on. So go online, sign up for what time you wanna come and wear a fun costume. Have a great time just getting dressed up, eating too much candy, and watching a movie with your church community. We hope you can come out on October 31st. Hey, as always, there's lots of ways to stay connected here at Calvary. You can go to our website, calvary.com, and there you can sign up for our Calvary Connection email. This is a weekly email that we send straight to your inbox with different ways to stay in touch with the church, for ways for you to get involved, 
to catch updates from missionaries and church leaders and ministries. Great email. I hope you can sign up for that. Other than that, uh, we're just praying that you have a great week, church. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you and believing that God wants to move you into deeper purpose and action for the kingdom of God and for the glory of Jesus in whatever sphere you're part of this week. So go boldly and with confidence. We love you, church. See you next Sunday.